Chapter 5 Rope Eleven kids had started basic training three months earlier. Lauren stood to attention in the snow with the five others who'd made it to the final checkpoint on their snowmobiles. Mr. Large, the head instructor, was eyeballing her. Can anybody here tell this young lady what polar bears do in the winter? He shouted. A couple of kids grumbled a response. Hibernate. That's right, Miss Thicko, Large grinned. They dig a big hole under the ice and they drift off to snoozy land until the daffodils pop up in springtime. If you'd bothered to study the training manual, you'd also have seen that bears eat fish and live on the ice flows near the coast. Not out here, over a hundred kilometres inland. Is that understood? Yes, sir, Lauren said meekly. And the radio? Why did you forget to switch on the encryption device? I was cold and tired and... Lauren saw Mr. Large's eyes bulge out behind his snow goggles and realised she was giving the wrong answer. Sorry, sir. No excuse, sir, she said sharply. Mr. Large shoved Lauren to the ground and plunged his size 15 boots into the snow on either side of her head. When I woke up this morning, Lauren Adams, Large spat, my back hurt. It hurt the same way it's hurt every single morning since a nasty little girl hit me with a spade five months back. Can you remind me who it was that did that? Me, sir? Lauren inquired innocently. If I'd had my way, you would have been permanently excluded from Cherub. Lauren had been surprised that Mr. Large hadn't made training harder for her from day one. Now she had the horrible realisation that he'd saved up his revenge for the very end. And so, Mr. Large said, to the ultimate test of courage that was mentioned in all of your mission briefings, there's been a slight change of plan. The briefing should now read, Ultimate Test of Lauren's Courage. Lauren felt a tear welling up behind her snow goggles as the icy ground chilled her back. She didn't reckon she could face a third attempt at basic training. Failure now would be the end of her cherub career. Mr. Large crushed Lauren's knuckles as he tugged her back to her feet. Who's the best swimmer out of you six trainees? Mr. Large asked, eyeballing Lauren again. Me, I suppose, Lauren said. That's right, isn't it? Mr. Large said cockily. Quite the little mermaid, I recall. So if one of you had to swim across a fast flowing river, grab six lovely grey cherub t-shirts and then swim back again, You'd be the ideal candidate, wouldn't you? Yes, sir, Lauren barked, trying desperately not to show Mr. Large how upset she was. He absolutely loved it when he made a trainee cry. Mr. Large took a step back and addressed the whole lineup. I'd suggest that all of you do what you can to help Lauren out, because if she doesn't come back with the t-shirts, I'll make each of you swim across individually and fetch your own. The river is 400 metres away, over the brow of the next hill. I'd suggest you get moving if you want to be indoors by sundown. Lauren led the row of kids scrambling uphill through the deep snow, dragging their equipment sleds behind them. Mr. Large and the two assistant training instructors, Mr. Speaks and Miss Smoke, followed them. The rushing water made a roar that overpowered all but the most persistent howls of wind. The river would have been over a hundred metres wide in the summer, but the banks were iced up cutting Lauren's swim to less than 60. Miss Smoke, a woman who was butch even by the standards of retired kickboxing champions, pointed her muscular arm at the opposite embankment. Your grey t-shirts are in a waterproof backpack behind that traffic cone, she rumbled. The six trainees huddled up and pulled their balaclavas away from their mouths so they could hear each other speak. As their steaming breath mingled, nobody could look Lauren in the eye. They felt sorry for her, but at the same time, it was a relief not to be suffering alongside her. It could have been worse, Lauren said, trying to sound cheerful and break the silence. I'll have to go in naked. If I'm wearing clothes, they'll freeze solid the second I step out of the water, and I'll never get them off. A 12-year-old Kurdish boy called Aram replied, We've all got Vaseline in our first aid packs. It will act as insulation if Lauren smears it on. That'll help keep me warm. Lauren nodded. What if we tie our rescue ropes together and knot them under Lauren's arms? Bethany suggested. 
It should be long enough to reach across the river, and we can haul her in if she gets in trouble. Good idea, Lauren grinned. I'll still have to swim out, but you guys can pull me back with the rope. Do you think you can make it over? Aram asked. It's going to be cold, and the current looks vicious, Lauren said. But the distance is only a bit more than one length of a swimming pool. The six trainees tied their rescue ropes together. Lauren double-checked all the knots. Then the kids burrowed inside their sleds and grabbed their tubs of Vaseline. Bethany led the way out to the riverbank and began helping Lauren unzip her outer layers of clothing. The kids knew from their survival manuals that any water flowing in these parts would be a couple of degrees above freezing. You wouldn't swim in it out of choice, but it was survivable. Lauren's real problem was the air outside the water, which was more than 15 degrees below freezing. A few minutes' exposure to temperatures this low would blister Lauren's bare skin, as surely as if she'd jumped into a bath of boiling water. Two of the boys laid a foam insulating mat on the snow and weighted down the ends with sleds to stop it blowing away. Okay, Lauren said. Does everyone know what their job is? I don't want any holdups. After a line of nods had satisfied Lauren, she sat on the foam mat and two of the boys started tugging at her snow boots. Once they were off, Lauren stood up and stepped out of her snowsuit and outer fleece layer in a single, frenzied movement. Next, she peeled away the tightly fitting inner fleece, followed by her socks and underwear. Bethany gathered up the inner layers of clothing as they were cast off and pushed them inside her snowsuit so they didn't freeze up. As soon as Lauren had hurled her knickers away, she dived onto the foam mat and the boys threw a couple of sleeping bags on top of her. Bethany leaned in and yelled, are you okay? Forgetting that Lauren no longer had three hats covering her ears. Lauren shuddered as she poked her head from under the sleeping bags and nodded. Give me the grease. Aram and his younger brother, Milar, began passing Lauren the tubs of Vaseline. She sunk her numb fingers into each tub and smeared it thickly over her body, trying not to wriggle too much because she didn't want any grease wasted by rubbing off onto the sleeping bags. When Lauren was well slathered, Bethany pushed one end of the nylon climbing rope under the sleeping bags. Lauren wound the rope under her arms and tied it into a bow knot, like a shoelace. That way she could pull on the bow and release herself easily if the rope became snagged. All ready? Aram asked. As ready as I'll ever be. Bethany and Aram each grabbed a corner of the insulated mat and dragged it onto the ice at the edge of the river, with Lauren curled up under the sleeping bags. They stopped a couple of metres shy of the water's edge, where the ice looked dangerously thin. Miss Smoke was waiting for them. She pulled back the sleeping bags and tested the knot in the rope under Lauren's arms. Remember, the air is much colder than the water, Smoke said gruffly. Keep your head under, except when you have to breathe, and don't hang around when you get to the other side. With no sleeping bags over her top half, Lauren was shivering too badly to speak, but she managed a nod. Okay. Smoke said. Get going. Bethany whipped the sleeping bags away from Lauren's legs. As Lauren sprang up, Aram gave her a quick inspection before moving in with a Vaseline smeared glove and patching up a few areas where the coating looked thin. Lauren had too much on her mind to give a damn about everyone seeing her naked. She took three quick tiptoe leaps over the thin ice and took a huge breath as she speared into the water. Because Lauren had acclimatised to a temperature 19 degrees colder than the water, a sense of calm passed over her as she began to swim. It almost felt warm. She set off in a powerful front crawl, turning her head to breathe whenever the choppy water allowed her to. After two minutes of swimming flat out, Lauren thought she must have almost reached the opposite bank. She raised her head out of the water to get a look. A blast of sleet pounded her face but she managed to keep her eyes open long enough to see that she was barely halfway across. Lauren felt crushed as she dived back under, swimming at a diagonal into the fierce current, pushing as hard as her aching body would allow. She now had serious doubts about her ability to make it across. The next minutes were the most agonising of Lauren's life. Her skin felt numb, and she was fighting a stitch down her left side. Finally, more than four shattering minutes after setting off, Lauren spotted the orange cone less than five metres from her face. Touching the ice sheet on the embankment was a relief, but getting out of the water was another challenge. Lauren's fingers were numb, and the ice gave her nothing to grip onto. 
Her first three goes at climbing out of the water failed, and she started getting desperate. At the fourth attempt, a wave pushed her at exactly the right moment, and she managed to lift a knee onto the ice. The danger now was of her bare skin freezing to the ice beneath the snow. The only way to prevent this was not to let any part of her body touch the ground for more than a fraction of a second. Shivering so violently that she could barely control her movements, Lauren quickly smeared the soles of her feet through some extra grease on her ankles. By the time she'd done this, a few dozen drips of water that hadn't been repelled by the Vaseline had frozen to the skin on her back. Every bead felt like a nail drilling her flesh. Lauren stood up to an eruption of encouraging screams from the opposite embankment. She took four quick leaps towards the orange cone and plucked the small backpack out of the snow behind it. When she'd hooked it over her shoulders, Lauren allowed herself a moment of triumph, turning to the other trainees and raising a thumb in the air. The first step back towards the water made Lauren scream out, as a layer of skin tore from the ball of her foot. The grease had rubbed away, and her damp sole had taken less than two seconds to freeze to the ground. She glanced back at the trail of blood in the snow, then took three painful steps and dived into the water. As soon as Lauren hit the water, she felt the rope dig into the joints under her arms as the other trainees began hauling it. She thought about trying to swim, but she was being dragged through the water too fast for it to make any difference. In fact, Lauren thought the five kids standing on the embankment were overdoing it. The rope felt like it was tearing her arms out of their sockets, and it was a struggle getting her head above the water for long enough to take a proper breath. At least the return journey was fast. Within 60 seconds, Lauren found herself being lifted out of the water and onto a sleeping bag by the two Kurdish boys. Once they dragged her away from the thin ice, they grabbed the soggy backpack off Lauren's shoulders while the other three trainees descended on her with towels. They rubbed off as much water as they could before rolling Lauren's gasping body onto the foam sleeping mat and throwing all their sleeping bags on top of her. Lauren felt her vision go out of focus as Bethany waved a thermal vest under her nose. Snap out of it, Bethany shouted. You've got to get your clothes back on before. When Lauren came around, she got a sniff of the grease still smeared over her body and shots of pain from the dressing over her foot and the rope burns under her arms. Hey, Bethany said gently. Welcome back, partner. Lauren realised she was on the floor at the base camp where they'd set off on their Alaskan trek five days earlier. The building was fantastically warm with electric lights and proper central heating. The other trainees were scattered around on the carpet on giant floor cushions, dressed in shorts and grey cherub t-shirts. Their hair was wet and must, like they toweled off after a shower. Most of them held steaming mugs. How long? <coughs> Lauren asked, erupting into a coughing fit before she could finish her sentence. Bethany looked at her watch. You've been out for about 40 minutes. Miss Smoke says you're suffering from mild hypothermia and exhaustion. She reckons you'll be fine after a few hours rest and some hot food and drink. And you'll be pleased to know that you making it across that river put Mr. Large in a stinking mood. Where's my grey t-shirt? Lauren asked drowsily. Bethany smirked. You're holding it in your hand. I didn't take it out of its packet in case you got grease over it. Lauren's fingers still felt numb but now she realised the t-shirt was in her hand, she pulled the polythene wrapped square up to her face and stared at the grey fabric with the cherub logo on it. No more training, Lauren grinned. Yeah, Bethany smiled. Undercover missions, here we come. Chapter 6. Missiles. John Jones showed James into his office. It wasn't as nice as Zara's, but it was a decent size, with three computers, a giant LCD television hanging on the wall, and a long suede-covered sofa. It was dark outside, and the floor-to-ceiling window overlooked moonlit trees. A 16-year-old wearing a black cherub t-shirt was sprawled over the sofa. James got excited when he realised it was Dave Moss. Dave was a legend. He'd earned his navy cherub t-shirt at 11, and his black t-shirt at 13, on a mission that brought down half the Ukrainian mafia. He spoke five languages and had won every cherub karate and judo tournament he'd ever entered. There were lots of talented kids at cherub, but Dave was one of the ones who managed to pull it off without everyone thinking he was a SWAT. 
His looks helped. Dave was tall and muscular, handsome in a grungy sort of way, with bright green eyes and long blonde hair. His girlfriends were always the hottest on campus, and there was even a rumour he'd got one of them pregnant. James had pretended to be appalled when Kerry told him, but as far as all the guys were concerned, the whiff of sex made Dave seem even cooler than he was already. Do you know David Moss? John Jones asked. No, I don't, James said nervously as he reached out and shook Dave's hand. Pleased to meet you, David. Call me Dave, Dave smiled. James felt like a tit. Who introduced themselves to someone like Dave Moss by saying, pleased to meet you? It was the kind of thing you'd say to an old granny at a funeral. David is highly regarded amongst the mission preparation staff, John Jones explained, and we're looking for two good agents to work alongside him on one of the most important missions Cherub has ever undertaken. James couldn't stop himself from grinning. I, I, I knew it was big, he stuttered. I, I mean, everyone knows Dave's reputation. You're not going to send him on some peddly little mission. You've not done badly yourself, James, Dave said reassuringly. I've read your personnel file. You've only been on two missions, but what you lack in quantity, you more than make up for in quality. Cheers, James grinned. The compliment made him feel a little more relaxed in the company of the campus hero. So what's this mission about? Dave looked at John Jones. Can I show him now, boss? John nodded. I'll just make it clear to James before you do. Whether or not you choose to accept this mission, everything you hear from now on must stay within these walls. James nodded. Of course, same as always. Dave reached down the arm of the sofa and picked up a fat aluminium tube with a shoulder stock and trigger hanging underneath it. Do you know what one of these is? It looks like a missile, James said. Got it in one, Dave said. You rest it on your shoulder and aim it at a tank, helicopter, whatever. You get one shot, then you throw the launch module away. This one is the latest model. The missile has a solid fuel rocket engine with a 10 kilometer range and more brain power than a room full of nerds. John went into detail. Around the time you were born, James, the Americans used Tomahawk cruise missiles in the first Gulf War. Until then, everyone dropped unguided bombs out of aeroplanes five kilometres up in the sky and crossed their fingers. You'd count yourself lucky if one bomb out of 20 hit the spot, and unlucky if you happened to live anywhere near a target. Then the Tomahawk missile came along. Suddenly, you could sit in a control room 500 kilometres from a war zone and send off a missile accurate enough to smack the target on the nose 99 times out of 100. This kind of accuracy gave the Americans a big tactical advantage, but it didn't come cheap. Every tomahawk cost half a million dollars. They were spending two billion dollars on missiles every day the Gulf War lasted. And even the Yanks don't have that sort of cash to throw around. Dave passed the missile across to James for a look. So, John continued, the big challenge for the Boffins wasn't to make precision-guided missiles bigger, or to give them longer range, or more accuracy, the challenge was to make them cheap. The weapon you're holding in your hand is the result of 15 years development. Its official acronym is PGSLM, Precision Guided Shoulder Launched Missile, but everyone calls it a buddy missile. It's built using off-the-shelf components, like those you might find inside computers or in-car navigation systems. You can program in targeting data using any laptop computer or handheld device capable of running an internet browser, or you can download live data on a moving target such as a car or ship via a satellite link. Then all you have to do is move within 10 kilometers of your target, either on the ground or from a helicopter. You point the dangerous end at the sky, press the trigger, and the missile weaves its merry way to the target. James admiringly turned the metal tube over in his hands. So how much does this cost? He asked. That one's a mock-up, John said. But the real deal comes in at under $15,000 a shot. Of course, the Americans will only sell this kind of technology to their closest allies. Safe, James said, as he pulled on the trigger and made a kapow noise. I'll start saving up. John smiled. As a matter of fact, James, we're hoping you'll be able to get your hands on some real ones. I thought the Americans were our allies. Won't they sell them to us? 
John smiled uneasily. The manufacturers gave the British Army 35 pre-production samples for field trials. A little under three weeks ago, we sent a Royal Air Force freighter aircraft to pick them up from a military base in Nevada. The truck carrying the missiles never showed up. You mean somebody nicked them? James gasped. Precisely, John nodded. The only consolation is that we think we know who took them. Terrorists? James asked. No, at least not directly. US intelligence thinks they were stolen on behalf of an illegal weapons dealer called Jane Oxford. These missiles are worth millions to the right buyer. We think she'll be holding on to them until some terrorist group or tin pot dictatorship is able to raise a very significant sum of money to buy them. Assuming we're right about this, Jane Oxford's greed will buy us time. How much damage could one of these missiles do? James asked. They're not big enough to pack an enormous explosive punch, John explained, but you don't need it with a weapon this accurate. Imagine a terrorist pointing a buddy missile out of a bedroom window in a London suburb and blasting Her Majesty out of bed at Buckingham Palace. That's the kind of capability we're talking about here. Is there anything you can do to defend against the missile once it's fired? Not a lot, John said. The Americans are looking at protecting their president by fitting a rapid-firing anti-missile phalanx gun onto a flatbed truck, but you're talking about a weapon designed for use on ships that rips off a thousand 20mm shells every minute. It's not the kind of thing you want going off accidentally in the middle of a presidential motorcade. Definitely not, James grinned. So where does Cherub fit into getting these missiles back? A decision was taken at cabinet level on both sides of the Atlantic not to release any information to the public about the stolen missiles, because of the panic it was likely to cause, John said. Dave interrupted. And because it would make a lot of politicians who claim to be winning the war on terrorism look dumb. The trouble is, John continued, law enforcement and intelligence agencies on both sides of the Atlantic have been trying to track down Jane Oxford and other members of her organisation since the early 1980s. They've got no more reason to believe they can catch her now than at any other time in the last 30 years. However, the Americans have one highly unusual lead. Only someone your age would be able to pursue it. Don't the Americans have their own version of Cherub? James asked. John shook his head as he pulled a mission briefing out of his desk drawer and threw it into James's lap. You'd better read this. Chapter 7. Briefing. Classified. Mission Briefing for James Adams. This document is protected with a radio frequency identification tag. Any attempt to remove it from the mission preparation building will set off an alarm. Do not photocopy or make notes. Jane Oxford, formerly Jane Hammond. Early years. Jane Hammond was born on a United States Army base in Hampshire, England, in 1950. She was the daughter of Captain Marcus Hammond, a US Army logistics specialist, and his wife Frances, a British citizen he'd met and married while based in the United Kingdom. Jane spent her early years living at various military installations around the world. She was a bright girl with a rebellious streak. At 15, while living in Germany, Jane ran away with a 19-year-old private in the US Marines. They surrendered themselves to the Parisian police three weeks later, when they ran out of money. By this time, Jane's father, Marcus Hammond, had risen to the rank of general and was close to retirement. He requested a final military posting near to his birthplace in California, believing that a return to the United States would help Jane settle down and gain qualifications to attend college. General Hammond was posted to Oakland Naval Base in California. He was put in charge of the supply chain, shipping troops and equipment across the Pacific to the escalating war in Vietnam. Jane, meanwhile, did not buckle down to her education as her father had hoped. She began to skip school regularly and hang out with a group of hippies. Photographs from this era show a grubby-looking girl with long braided hair, strings of beads around her neck, and flared jeans with holes over the knees. Jane became interested in anti-Vietnam War issues through a boyfriend called Fowler Wood. 20-year-old Fowler was a dropout from the nearby University of California and the chairman of a radical anti-Vietnam War protest group. Fowler became fascinated with General Hammond's job. He'd been searching for a non-violent way to blunt the American war effort 
and came up with the idea of sabotaging weapons passing through Oakland docks. Jane began dipping into the papers her father brought home each night. She even broke into his office and took blank security passes for the wharves where the goods were being loaded onto ships. Jane learned about a regular shipment of assault rifles. Fowler and his anti-war movement colleagues hatched a plan. It involved using stolen security passes to bring a truckload of caustic lime into the docks. The protesters planned to break open the weapon crates and shovel powdered lime over the guns. By the time the guns arrived in Vietnam, the lime would have corroded the metal, making them useless. Two nights before the raid was set to take place, Fowler's peace group took a vote and decided that the guerrilla action was too risky. Or as Jane put it, the little wimps chickened out. She immediately broke up with Fowler. She stole his car and her mother's checkbook and headed south, paying her way towards Mexico with bad checks. Jane Hammond meets Kurt Oxford. Jane got as far as San Diego, which borders onto the Mexican town of Tijuana. She found a room in a cheap motel and began scouring the local bars, looking for someone who could sell her the fake passport and driver's license she needed to cross the border. Instead, she found Kurt Oxford. Kurt was a mountainous 28-year-old outlaw biker, complete with beard, tattoos, and a prison record for violent behaviour and armed robbery. He'd co-founded a motorcycle club called the Brigands. At the time, it was the second largest motorcycle gang in California, and a bitter rival of the internationally famous Hells Angels. Jane took up the offer of a room in Kurt's house, which also served as a clubhouse for the Brigands. The Brigands were suspected of paying for their lifestyle by smuggling drugs across the border from Mexico, and Kurt's house was under 24-hour police surveillance. Archived photographs show Jane making a rapid transformation from hippie to leather and denim clad biker. Police didn't bother inquiring as to who Jane was, or where she had come from, because of the notoriously low status of women within the biker subculture. According to the rulebook of the Brigand Motorcycle Club, women were not allowed to join the gang as full members, ride motorcycles except as pillion passengers, engage in any criminal activity, or speak at official club meetings except to offer food or drink to the men. Kurt became excited when he heard Jane's story about the stolen security passes and the cases of guns at Oakland Navy Base but he was no peace protester. His plan was to steal two truckloads of guns and sell them on the black market to a drug-dealing acquaintance in Mexico, who would in turn sell the weapons on to rebel and terrorist groups in Africa and South America. Jane had attended dozens of anti-war demonstrations while living in Oakland. Despite this, she readily agreed to Kurt's gun smuggling plan. Criminal psychologists have described Jane's behaviour as a textbook example of an extreme thrill-seeker, a person with few moral scruples, who finds everyday life boring and constantly craves dangerous relationships and activities. The Rise and Fall of Kurt and Jane Oxford Kurt Oxford and Jane Hammond robbed the docks at Oakland Navy Base on three separate occasions, earning themselves over $25,000, equivalent to $145,000 at today's prices. Jane did some research and realised that every military supply depot in the United States used identical, easy-to-fake security paperwork. Over the next two years, Kurt and Jane staged over 80 robberies in United States military facilities. Jane had stolen reference books from her father that showed where different kinds of military supplies were stored. She would place an order over the phone, pretending to be the assistant of a senior officer in the logistics corps. The next day, a clean-shaven Kurt would arrive at the supply depot in an army surplus truck, wearing uniform and carrying a set of authentic-looking paperwork that Jane had typed up in her motel room the night before. The truck would be loaded up and Kurt would drive out laden with weapons. The Mexican arms dealer would then ship the load to South America. The beauty of this scheme was that the robberies went unnoticed, at least to begin with. With a quarter of a million troops on duty in Vietnam, thousands of US military trucks were moving weapons and ammunition around the country. The paper-based stock control system made keeping an up-to-date tally on every movement impossible. Even when someone checked the paperwork and noticed that a truckload of guns had vanished, it would be several months after the event and everyone would assume it was a clerical error rather than a robbery. By 1968, Kurt and Jane were earning over $20,000 a month from their illegal weapons business, the 2005 equivalent of $110,000. With over half a million dollars stashed in overseas bank accounts, 
they had started flying first class and staying in five-star hotels. They also stopped doing robberies themselves and began relying on members of the brigand's motorcycle gang to do their dirty work. On the 26th of December, 1968, Kurt Oxford and Jane Hammond landed in Las Vegas and booked a suite at the Desert Inn Resort and Casino. Kurt purchased a two-carat diamond ring, and the next morning, he took his 18-year-old girlfriend on a limousine ride to a wedding chapel. After the ceremony, Kurt and Jane changed into swimwear, got drunk at the poolside, and began losing heavily at a floating blackjack table. Kurt took offence when another blackjack player called him a fool. Kurt punched the man out and ended up being hauled into a back room by casino security. He was taken to the local police station, where the Las Vegas police ran a routine check. They found that Kurt had skipped bail on a Nevada assault charge five years earlier, following a fight between rival motorcycle gangs in Reno. Less than six hours after getting married, Kurt was locked up in Las Vegas County Jail, facing a three to five year sentence. Jane pledged to stand by her husband, but was then shocked to discover that her husband had violated his California parole and that police there wanted to question him about an unsolved murder. Kurt Oxford was extradited to California. On the 24th of January 1969, five days before his trial for murder was due to begin, Kurt became involved in a fight in the prison exercise yard. A guard fired a warning shot, but the fight continued, and Kurt received a shotgun blast in his chest. He died of his wounds in the prison hospital 11 days later. Jane Oxford, International Arms Dealer By the time she turned 19, Jane Oxford had run away from her family, amassed a half a million dollar fortune, equivalent to $2.6 million today, got married and seen her husband die in prison. Jane had no police record, apart from a missing persons report filed by her father in Oakland, Fearing a public scandal, General Hammond had honoured the bad checks and compensated Fowler Wood for his stolen car. Some people might have quit while they were ahead, but Jane Oxford spent the 1970s transforming herself from a thief into a big-time black market weapons dealer. The business of stealing from the US military thrived. When the army launched an investigation into the large amount of missing equipment and tightened up security, Jane developed more sophisticated techniques for relieving the US military of its weapons. Every American base had its share of bored, broke and homesick servicemen who were willing to turn a blind eye, or drive a truck off base in return for a car, or enough cash to put down a deposit on a home. The next step in developing the business was for Jane to bypass her Mexican connection and deal directly with people who wanted to buy the stolen weapons. She travelled the world using a variety of aliases and disguises, making contacts with terrorist groups, drug czars, local warlords and dictators. Jane brokered deals to sell weapons from all over the world, but most of her profits continued to stem from her unique web of corrupt contacts within the US military. In 1982, a retired member of the brigands bike gang called Michael Smith was arrested at the gates of an army base in Kentucky after attempting to pass a security check with a truckload of mortars. Smith had lost the paperwork given to him by an associate of Jane Oxford and stupidly tried to carry out the robbery using crudely altered paperwork from a previous raid. Smith had been involved in dozens of military supply thefts over the preceding decade. He offered to give the US military police information on Jane Oxford and her organisation in return for a light prison sentence. Smith was stunned by the answer the US military police gave him. Not only was nobody looking for Jane Oxford, they'd never even heard of her. Following Michael Smith's tip-off, Jane Oxford went from being an unknown to a spot on the FBI's most wanted list. The FBI, CIA and US military police set up a 200-person task force to bring Jane Oxford to justice. The trouble was, almost nothing was known about her. After 14 years of successfully stealing American weapons, Jane had put distance between herself and the day-to-day operation of her organisation. Nobody knew who her deputies were, what country she lived in, if she'd married again or had children. Jane had made no contact with her parents since leaving home 16 years earlier, and the nearest thing to an up-to-date picture was the photograph found in the uncollected personal effects of the late Kurt Oxford. It had been taken in the Las Vegas Wedding Chapel in 1969, 
and to this day, it remains the most recent photograph of Jane Oxford on FBI records. After numerous stings, surveillance operations, attempts at infiltration and 20 million hours of police work, Jane Oxford is still at large. The FBI task force chasing after Jane call her the ghost. Current status of Jane Oxford's organisation. The world is now awash with cheap illegal weapons produced in former communist countries. Consequently, it is impossible to turn a profit stealing everyday weapons from the American military. Nowadays, it is America's high-tech weapons that are of interest to black market weapons dealers. Since 1998, it is believed Jane Oxford has orchestrated more than 20 carefully planned thefts of high-tech equipment from the US military. Stolen items have included night vision sites for sniper rifles, unmanned miniature surveillance aircraft, radar jamming equipment, plasma injecting anti-tank shells, and surface-to-air missiles. These relatively compact loads are easily smuggled across the US-Mexican border, and each one is worth millions of dollars to the right customer. The latest and most serious act was the theft of 35 PGSLM buddy missiles, which were crossing the Nevada desert en route to a British military cargo aircraft. After this theft, Jane Oxford was promoted to second place on the FBI's list of most wanted criminals. An unexpected breakthrough. In May 2004, a troubled 14-year-old boy named Curtis Key escaped the night curfew at an Arizona military boarding school and ploughed through a set of locked gates in his commandant's car. He parked up at a nearby liquor store, picked up a bottle of coke, and asked the clerk for vodka from behind the counter. When the clerk asked for proof of age, Curtis Key produced a handgun and shot the clerk through the heart. He calmly emptied half the bottle of coke onto the floor, topped up the bottle with vodka, and took a long drink. CCTV cameras inside the store filmed the entire event. On the way out, Curtis spotted a man getting out of a Jaguar. After shooting the driver and his girlfriend dead, Curtis took the Jaguar and drove more than 20 miles at high speed, slugging the mixture of vodka and coke the whole time. When he heard the sirens of three chasing police cars, Curtis, by now paralytically drunk, pulled up at the roadside. He picked his gun off the passenger seat, pushed the muzzle against his head, and pulled the trigger. The bullet jammed in the chamber. Under Arizona state law, anyone aged 14 or over, charged with a serious offence such as murder, can be tried and sentenced to the same prison term as an adult. In October 2004, Curtis Key was deemed mentally fit and given life without parole. This sentence means Curtis will spend the rest of his life in prison. He is currently one of the 270 offenders serving time in the specially built Young Offenders Unit at Arizona Maximum Security Prison, known by its staff and inmates as Arizona Max. Bizarrely, Curtis's parents did not come forward after his arrest. The home address registered at the military school turned out not to exist, and Curtis's school fees had been paid from an untraceable bank account in the Seychelles. Curtis claimed that he had lost his memory and remembered nothing about his mother and father. Arizona police suspected Curtis was protecting a parent or parents who were wanted criminals and sent his DNA profile to the FBI. The profile showed there was a 99% chance that Curtis was a descendant of General Marcus Hammond, who had agreed to give a DNA sample to the FBI team trying to locate his daughter. There was only one possible explanation. Curtis Key was the son of Jane Oxford. What use is Curtis Oxford? The FBI were delighted. The unearthing of Curtis Key was the biggest breakthrough in the 22-year hunt for Jane Oxford. The FBI didn't let on that they'd uncovered Curtis's true lineage and mounted close surveillance on him. They sent an officer into Arizona Max to work as a guard on Curtis's young offender unit and carefully monitored all his communications, both with other prisoners and with the outside world, in the form of letters and telephone calls. Jane Oxford was clearly working behind the scenes. Her connections within the biker community put out word inside Arizona Max that Curtis was untouchable. Anyone trying to bully, extort money, or otherwise harm Curtis could expect both themselves and their families on the outside to face savage retribution. Two prison officers on Curtis's unit also reported to their superiors that they had been approached by a mysterious biker offering them $1,500 a month if they agreed to look out for Curtis and occasionally smuggle items into his cell. 
While Jane Oxford was doing all she could to look after her son, the FBI's hopes that she would stick her neck out and try to visit Curtis were never realised. Apart from his lawyer, the only people on Curtis Key's list of approved telephone contacts and visitors were two men from Las Vegas who claimed to be Curtis's uncles. Covert DNA tests carried out on the men showed that they were not blood relatives of Curtis. Despite this, the men were put on the approved contacts list and the conversations that took place during their visits were bugged. Curtis seemed to know his visitors well, and they clearly had contacts with his mother. The men are still under FBI surveillance. Unfortunately, this surveillance has yet to yield any useful information on the activities or whereabouts of Jane Oxford. As Curtis's first months in prison passed by, the FBI became convinced that their big breakthrough had turned into a damp squib. To minimise the already slight chance that anyone would dare to harm Curtis, his visitors informed the prison authorities that his real name was Curtis Oxford, and told Curtis to reveal his true identity to fellow inmates. Once this secret was out, the FBI realised that the chances of Jane ever visiting her son had shrunk to zero. Escape and Infiltrate If Jane Oxford wasn't planning to visit her son in prison, the next best thing would be if Curtis got out and someone could follow him back to his mother. The FBI studied a number of options for getting Curtis out of prison. They looked for legal loopholes that would get Curtis off the hook, and considered a scheme where the Arizona police miraculously discovered new evidence that would make Curtis look innocent. The problem was, clear video footage showed Curtis shooting the clerk in the off-license. He had pleaded guilty in court, and the feelings of the families of his three victims also had to be taken into consideration. Besides, Jane Oxford has spent the last 30 years sniffing out FBI stings. If her son was miraculously released from prison, she would undoubtedly smell a giant rat. The FBI realised that Jane would be less suspicious if her son escaped from prison. They devised an elaborate plan that they called Escape and Infiltrate. It involved sending undercover agents into Arizona Max as prisoners. The agents would win Curtis's trust and then announce that they had found an escape route. They would offer Curtis a chance of escape. In return, they would ask Curtis to get Jane Oxford to protect them and set them up with false identities in another country. Jane Oxford might be suspicious, but the FBI reckoned that if every detail of Curtis's escape was made to look absolutely real, including the faked murder of a prison guard and a full police alert to recapture the escapees, she might just buy it. If the agents managed to pull off their escape and hold Jane and Curtis up to their end of the bargain, they would gain unprecedented access to Jane Oxford's organisation, and perhaps even make contact with Oxford herself. The FBI agreed that it was a risky plan. They rated the chances of success at less than one half, and the undercover agents would be at serious risk of death or injury at the hands of other law enforcement agencies that would be out trying to recapture them. But the biggest stumbling block was that under Arizona law, Juveniles may be tried as adults and held inside adult prisons, but they cannot be held within sight or sound of adult prisoners. If the FBI want to get undercover agents to befriend Curtis Oxford, they will have to wait until he turns 18 and is moved into the adult population of Arizona Max. This is not due to happen until 2009. The Role of British Intelligence and Cherub Although Jane Oxford was known to British intelligence, she had never stolen British military equipment and was regarded as an American problem until the theft of the 35 Buddy missiles in March 2005. The British began an investigation to see if anyone on their side of the Atlantic had leaked details about the movement of the Royal Air Force cargo aircraft sent across the Atlantic to collect the missiles. They also sent a senior British intelligence officer to America to work alongside the FBI team investigating the theft. The MI5 officer sent a top-secret briefing back to Britain. It included details of the FBI's long-term plan to send undercover agents into Arizona Max and escape with Curtis Oxford. When the chairman of Cherub read this briefing, he realised that the FBI's ambitious escape and infiltrate plan could be carried out immediately if underage Cherub agents were sent into the juvenile unit at Arizona Max. An escape carried out by people too young to be employed by law enforcement agencies would also make it easier to convince Jane Oxford that the escape is genuine. John Jones has been selected as mission controller and has begun working out exact details of a plan that will send two Cherub agents into Arizona Max, with a third Cherub agent aiding the escape on the outside. Note: 
The Cherub Ethics Committee passed this mission briefing on condition that all agents understand the following. This mission has been classified high risk. All agents are reminded of their right to refuse to undertake this mission and to withdraw from it at any time. The mission will involve incarceration in a dangerous prison environment and pursued by armed prison guards and police. For security reasons, only a tiny number of senior law enforcement officials will be aware that Cherub and the FBI have set up the escape. While every possible step will be taken to ensure your safety, the agents deployed on this mission are urged to consider the dangers carefully before accepting their role. Wow, James said when he put the briefing down on John Jones's desk. That whole breaking out of prison deal sounds berserk. I'm not asking for an instant decision, John said, but this is our only half-decent shot at getting hold of Jane Oxford and the buddy missiles. How about you think it through and come see me in the morning? James shook his head. I'm not scared, he said firmly. I'll do it. John smiled. I'd be much happier if you slept on it before making a final decision. I'll even allow you to discuss it with Merrill Spencer if you want. Whatever, James said dismissively. I take it me and Dave are the two people going into Arizona Max? John nodded. You're only a few months younger than Curtis Oxford, and roughly the same physical size. You're a perfect candidate to make friends with him. For the purposes of this mission, Dave will be your older brother. We need a big guy like him to protect you on the inside, and to dress up as a guard during the escape. He's also got lots of high-speed driving experience. So who's the third person on the mission? James asked. The one who's going to help our escape from outside the prison. We want someone who would pass as a sibling or cousin to you and Dave, John explained. But we're having a tricky time finding the right person. What about my sister Lauren? James asked. Today's her last day of basic training. If she gets through, she'd be eligible to come. John smiled. Lauren's a good kid, James, but I'm really looking for someone more experienced. 